Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker for the evening, Kelly Beatty. Kelly has been at the skyscrapers a number of times. He's a longtime friend of ours, always a great speaker. And tonight he's going to be talking about Stonehenge. And I saw this talk a few months ago at the Maine Astronomy Retreat and Symposium. And I thought it was a really great talk to be good for our holiday meeting, which is why Kelly is here. I know this one. What? Sign language. In, in my talk. Thank you. Uh, so I thought it'd be great if Kelly could come. And uh, since I saw it four months ago at my age, I've already forgotten what he said. So it's going to be like a new me talk again tonight. So Kelly, uh, for those of you that may not know his background, it's coming in and out. Uh, Kelly has been explaining the science and wonder of astronomy to the public since 1974. Uh, that's when he joined the staff. What is this? I don't know. It might be because I'm moving. Okay. All right. I'm sorry about this going in and out, but uh, he joined the staff of Sky and Telescope. And uh, he's an award winning writer and communicator. He specializes in planetary science. And space exploration. Uh, after 43 years of pounding the keyboard, in 2018, he retired from full time work but remains actively involved with Sky Telescope tours and other projects. Uh, occasionally, he gets interviewed on the Weather Channel and National Public Radio, and he holds a bachelor's degree from the California Institute of Technology and a master's from Boston University. He also has an asteroid named after him, number 2925, and that was. Named on the occasion of his marriage in 1983. How did you arrange that? Well, maybe you could tell us after. <laughs> and uh, in 1986, he was chosen as one of the 100 semifinalists for NASA's Journalism in Space program. So, a lot of experience. I'm very excited to hear his talk tonight. And I uh, want to give Kelly a warm skyscraper welcome and thank you for coming down. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for the introduction. For the introduction. It's great to be back. Great to be back in person. About that asteroid. I went to Caltech, and um, one of the people that I met, two of the people I met there were Gene Shoemaker and Eleanor Helene, the Laura Helene, who at the time were just starting the search for near Earth objects, for satellite or uh, asteroids that could uh, potentially uh, strike the Earth. And Glow approached me to ask whether I'd consider being one of the observing students for this search. And by that point in my life, I had decided that spending my nights out in the cold was not my ideal career. Great for a hobby, it's not great if you have to do it every night. So uh, I declined, but we remained good friends. And, and uh, in the years after, we stayed in touch, and when we got married, Glow had the, the way asteroid discoveries work, you know, you can name them, but you can't name them after yourself. And a lot of the programs that, that, that discover a lot of asteroids, they end up with a pile of asteroids that have not been named because they haven't gone to the government's name yet. So once, once 295 had been uh, numbered, that is to say, it had gone around the sun three times, so its orbit was secured, and there's no chance of it's getting lost. It gets a number, and once it's numbered, it can be named. And Glow honored my wife and me with 2925. And I, I run into a lot of people with asteroids named after them. None of them have a number as low as mine, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. So the story there is that when Cheryl and I got married, we had this gift of an asteroid given to us. And the priest in our wedding announced to the congregation, I want you all to know that Kelly and Cheryl have been honored, they got a star named after them. Some of you are old enough to remember the International Star Registry, which I guess continues. And so a big round of applause. And then at the reception afterward, people would come up to me and say, Oh, Kelly, congratulations on having the star named after you. And I said, No, actually, it wasn't a star, it was an asteroid. And they paused a moment and said, Oh, well, that's okay too. <laughs> All right, well, I have, before I get started, I have two questions for you, uh, or, or, or two comments. Uh, the first is that. You might not remember this, but two years ago, when we were all swamped with pandemia, um, we were largely stuck at home. And as counterintuitive as this might seem, it was a great time for the growth 
of amateur astronomy. Because people were stuck at home, they rediscovered the night sky, telescope sails went through the roof. And it was a perfect storm in a bad way because remember the supply chain problems that were initially so uh, uh, severe, all those container ships stuck off the coast of California, that's where all the telescopes were that were coming from China. So there was a, a shortage of telescopes to begin with. And then everybody went running out to Orion and High Point Scientific and all the places that we go to buy telescopes and they all wanted uh, uh, began to level telescopes. I had people, people that I know, like in the Boston uh, TV station, you know, circle. The anchors were calling me, Kelly. I desperately need a telescope for my for my niece. Where do I go? And so, what what I take from that is that there were millions of telescopes sold during the pandemic to brand new people getting into astronomy. Elijah, this is Elijah, right? Yes, sir. Do you have a telescope? See, yes. when did you buy it? Um, I got it for Christmas two years ago. Two years ago. Dang. <laughs> and so, like Elijah, there are millions of also here. Okay. So, so here's the thing. Your next gen, we all we all worry about this all the time, do we not? Where will the next generation of amateur astronomers come from? They're out of it. They've got telescopes. They've got interest. And our job collectively is to find them and bring them in. I suspect your club grew. Your club has grown in the last couple yes. of years. The same for the amateur telescope in Boston. Every club. This is great. It, it would help if the average age of the new members wasn't like you know 50 and it was more closer to 15. But we'll take anybody we can get, and it's a great time to be out there and be interested in an amateur astronomy. So capitalize on that while you can. Second thing I want to ask is. How many of you are individual members of the International Dark Sky Association? Raise your hand, please. Individual members. I see three besides me. That's pretty darn sad. If you think about it, the IDA has roughly 3,000 paying members, and there are roughly 100,000 amateur, no, I'm sorry, a quarter of a million, probably closer to 300,000. We'll round up to 300,000. It's a good round number. 3,000 members, 300,000 and I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, 300, I'm sorry. 300,000 amateur astronomers, 3,000 members. Roughly, that means that only one in every hundred amateur astronomers is a member of the IDA. And guess what? You're not far off of that statistic, okay? And yet we, as a group, are the ones who stand the most to gain or lose from the battle against light pollution. And so my, my challenge to you, after we're done here tonight, is to go home, become members of the IDA, and here's why. I am a very active member of the IDA in Massachusetts. I'm sponsoring state legislation. I'm helping towns. I'm appearing at a council meeting. There's only one of me. The whole entire staff of the IDA is about nine people. And yet it casts this huge shadow. It has outside importance in this very important environmental crisis that we're facing with light pollution. The more money the IDA, IDA has, the more staff it can fund, the more battles that can be fought. And so that's my challenge to you is to think really hard about becoming a member of the IDA, each and every one of you. Fight the good fight so that your dark sky sites and your backyard don't get bright as fast. I can't keep them from getting bright at all. But but to, to curb this, this scourge of light pollution. We're in the midst of a once in a multi-generational change with LEDs of the way we light the night. This hasn't happened since the 1950s and 60s. And these LEDs will last a long time. So it's imperative to get the right ones installed now while we have a chance to do so. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> all right, so tonight I'm going to start sharing my screen here as best I can. Share sound, that part going. Harry has started screen sharing. Good. So far, so good. We start the slideshow. And it should be wonderful. <laughs> it never happens if we do it. Okay. This is a fun talk. This talk was a couple of years in the making and you'll see why very soon. 
Most of us have an idea of what Stonehenge is. It's a pile of rocks in a circle out somewhere in the middle of the English plain. Oh yeah, and the summer solstice sunrise has druids all over the place. And that's mostly true. But it's turned out to be much more than that. And it also turns out that within the last couple of years, we have learned a tremendous amount about Stonehenge and its origin. And this is therefore that story. So we're going to start by getting an understanding. This is what we're going to cover tonight. It's not just when and, and, and how it was built, but why it was built and where it's been discovered recently. So let's get the, the time frame set here. We're talking about uh, BC times, prehistoric times in some sense. Uh, the Mesolithic period in history was the beginning of the Stone Age, the use of stone tools, just you know, to bash the head of an antelope or something like that. Uh, as we move into the Neolithic, then those stone tools become more sophisticated. They're chipped to have edges, they become scrapers, they become accents, and so forth. Late Neolithic is characterized by uh, uh, a sort of transition from being hunter gatherers to actually being agrarian, staying in the same place, growing crops, so forth. And then the, the, the Copper Age Bronze Age is sort of self explanatory. And so most, most of what happens in the Stone Age is, uh, is, is early to uh, happens in Neolithic times. So who were these people in England? Not who you think. The first inhabitants of England probably looked like this, a very unusual combination of dark skin and blue eyes. How do we know this? Because in Cheddar, England, uh, about a century ago was discovered the corpse, a well-preserved corpse, uh, what became known as Cheddar Man. And only recently, with, with uh, uh, very sophisticated uh, DNA techniques, they've been able to reconstruct what they think Cheddar Man looked like. So this is a, a, uh, a bust in, in the Natural History Museum in England, in London, and the team has gone to recreate that. So these were the first inhabitants of England. These were uh, the Mesolithic hunter gatherers in southern England. And you're saying, well, okay, so, so then what happened? Well, it turns out that it wasn't always the case that England and the British Islands were islands. During the last major ice age, roughly 10,000 BC, so much ice was piled upon the land that the strait, right, the, 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 the English Channel and much more to the east uh, was dry land. And so, so anybody could cross into England freely back and forth from what was continental Europe. And so it turns out that during this uh, uh, ice age or the late stages of it, while that land bridge still existed, a lot of, of not hunter gatherers, but a, a lot of um, farmers. Uh, early Neolithic farmers came from uh, mostly Eastern Mediterranean, maybe Turkey, and inhabited England and displaced the hunter-gatherers that had lived there. So that's where a lot of the origin of the current English are. They were, not, they were farmers, so they cleared a lot of the forest, and there were great plains, meadows, and fields, and so forth. This is a, these are obviously depictions. Whoever they were, these people love to make things out of stone. They had stone cairns, they had stone circles, they had uh, hedges, which are basically a circular ditch, as monuments all over the British Islands. You can see, so you can see the little dots there. Um, and so let me just give you a, a flavor for some of the places that were erected in that period of time. One of my favorites is actually outside of Dublin. Not not far from Dublin. Any of you who ever go to Ireland or to Dublin, you should visit this place. It's called New Grange. It's in the Bruin Warren, which is basically the bend of the Boyne River. That's what that means, means in Gaelic. Um, and so it's a huge earthen mound, roughly the size of a football field. You can see the people down here. I'll try to use my cursor. I think that will be if my cursor will work. Here we go. Right. I see the cursor, kind of. It's not being, oh, here we go. All right, down here, it's just a little bit of a delay. Those are people. 
okay, down there at the bottom. And so you get the sense of the scale of this. This is a giant uh, cemetery. Uh, the dead were buried here, and that opening faces toward the rising of the sun, not at the summer solstice, but the winter solstice. Wait a second, I'm going to turn this off. Good idea. And so on the on the few days around the winter solstice, the sunlight streams through this narrow passageway, which you can go into and visit. And you can see the inner barrier chamber, which is quite small. Pretty, pretty marked. Great place. New Ranch. Elsewhere in the British Isles, especially in the northern end, are some interesting monuments that are, are fun to visit. This is one of my favorites. This is the Standing Stones of Colonish. It's on the Isle of Lewis, where you can see the pin up there. It's way up there. You're going to want to get there. But when you do get there, you'll be the only person. There's, there's no entrance fee. It's like a little, like, cat and turnstile. You go in, you're just clicking to see how many people visit. And um, uh, a short story here. Uh, Cheryl and I, along with one of my two brothers and his wife, went to the Isle of Lewis, which is where I took this picture. And the year's fee was 2000, who knows, 2012, I think, or 13. No. Oh, okay. We were younger then. <laughs> and the reason we were there was that because there was going to be an annual eclipse at sunrise from this location. And I had this dreamy vision of taking a picture of the rising annular eclipse sun with all of these stones in the foreground uh, in silhouette. Fantastic. This is taken the night before the eclipse. I was screwed. Because I've been watching a clearing crossing the Atlantic and it got there too early. It was beautiful at sunset the night before. On the morning of the eclipse, it was raining like there was no tomorrow. I was really, I missed a clear eclipse into my time. That one hit me really hard. That's England, boy. Exactly. Here's another ring of standing stones on Orkney, uh, the Ring of Rodgar, which is actually a circle. Um, it's beautiful territory. This is a fragment of a stone circle in Stennis, also on Orkney. Cheryl and I visited these just this past summer. And um, uh, there, so these, these stone monuments are all over the place. And then, of course, there's stone, which exceeds all of them, not only in terms of its scale, but its sophistication, as you'll see. Now, Stonehenge is located on the Salisbury Plain. It's roughly 50 miles to the southwest of London in an area that's undistinguished. It isn't like there is like giant rivers coming together or huge rock formations that would signal this place being special in any way. You can see that it's cleared because the hunter gatherers cleared all the land and it's been an agrarian uh, ever since. Uh, in, throughout all of modern history. There's nothing special about it. You can see there's a there's a road there crossing nearby. Don't see a parking lot. Ah, and the reason you don't see a parking lot, his point was that there's no parking lot. The parking lot is over here on the left, outside of the field of view. Uh, I'll mention this again, 800,000 people a year, per year, visit Stonehenge. And so they're kept off site, they're bussed in, to keep the crowd control, and, and you, you can see the pathway. You don't actually get to walk inside along the stones. We'll get to that in a little bit later. And yet, despite the fact that there's nothing distinguishing this area of land, it's very heavily populated with these Neolithic monuments, Mesolithic monuments. Not only is there Stonehenge, which is down there in the lower left corner, there's a big circular hinge called Durrington Walls. There's a wood hinge, which I'll show you in a, in a couple of seconds. And uh, down there near the bottom center, recently was discovered a site which is uh, colloquially called Blue Stonehenge. Uh, that was another site of a, of a stone circle, but the stones are not there anymore, and that's part of the interesting history. So this is an aerial view of Durrington Wall, which is a large crescent-shaped uh, hinge or, or, or earthwork up there at the top. And then down there in the lower right corner, is Woodhenge or what's left of it. Now, Woodhenge today looks like this. This is where the, the poles would have been. Those are concrete uh, proxies, if you will, or what would have been a large a wooden pillar, a, a couple of hundred of them. 
And this is an artist's concept of what Whitman might have looked like in its prime. And so we have to start asking ourselves, okay, okay, you can you can take this tree, you can strip it apart, you can put it in a hole in the ground, but why? Why would you do it? And it also turns out that Woodhenge and Stonehenge are almost the same scale. This may be important. I'm not sure. It's often thought that uh, these days that maybe Woodhenge, which is located next to Durrington Walls, was a monument to the living, and Stonehenge was a monument to the dead. So some of the earliest depictions of Stonehenge were somewhat fanciful. This is the earliest known from the uh, late 1500s. Uh, it, it shows more of the, the archways, the giant uh, stone sarsens, the, the large stones are called sarsens, uh, intact. Here's another one of wet watercolor. This had to have been painted before 1797. And the reason is that one of the giant trilophons, as they're called, I think it's that one there on the extreme far left, fell during the storm in 1797. And that's the important thing to remember that the Stonehenge you see today uh, has been has had a couple of baselists. Because over time, and this is true of a lot of the stone monuments in, in, in the British Isles, the stones were were it took a lot of trouble to, to you know quarry them and get them in place. And when one monument kind of fell out of use or out of favor, they would raid those stones for use someplace else. So all of the stones that were originally at Stonehenge are not there now. And many of the ones that are there now are not pretty, they're like on the ground. Well, it turns out that this property was always privately owned in recent times. And for a long time in the 1800s, it was owned by the Andrews. It came to pass that in the early 1900s, the last surviving error Heir, not heir lord, the last surviving heir of the Andrews family had no one to leave it to, so he put up a lot of his estate for auction, including the property that is Stonehenge. And so Sir Cecil Chubb, a wealthy man who lived, I think he was a banker, who actually lived in Salisbury, and his wife, Lady Mary Chubb, uh, seeing her with him, uh, they, they were interested in this auction. And so Sir Cecil uh, said to Mary, uh, I'm going down to the auction, you need anything? And she said, yes, I would love a set of curtains if they're available. <laughs> so he went down to the auction and came back with Stonehenge. <laughs> Having bought it for 6,600 pounds, which is roughly uh, a few hundred thousand dollars uh, at, current, at current market value. So you can imagine her surprise when she couldn't hang it on her curtains. Her curtains. So, <clears throat> Sir Cecil had a plan. He knew by then it was known that this was an important archaeological site. They didn't quite understand why it was there, but they knew somebody had gone to a lot of trouble. And so three years after buying it, he deeded it back to the British people. And so it know that for the first time it was no longer by the hand. It was a public property, and the British government, the, uh, the antiquities department, uh, Parks and Rec, if you will, um, Hired uh, learned to ten girl William Holly and a crew to sort of clean the place up because they've been through the centuries of neglect. And he did a lot of work. It was a multi year project uh, lasting eight years. It was quite well known, even in the United States. This is from the Richmond Times Dispatch. It sent a report over to check this out. Big, huge project to get some of these stones re erected. And, uh, and, and so what Holly's crew did was to reset, many of the sarsens had fallen over, those the biggest ones, and he repositioned them, stood them up, because the hole was still obvious, but the, over time the holes had got filled in somewhat, so they, they didn't always put them back exactly where they probably should have been. They did excavate the site. This, this whole area, it looked green in the area of oil, was, but that's just the top surface, the top soil. The underlying rock is chalk. Like the White Cliffs of Dover is chalk. And so that, that that will become very important, as we will see in our story. He also discovered around the hinge, uh, which goes well outside Stonehenge, um, the uh, uh, a series of 56 holes 
which had been known in the 1700s by a guy named John Aubrey who had discovered them, but then the, the knowledge of them had become lost. So Holly's team rediscovered them, these Aubrey holes. Well, that wasn't the end of it. Uh, he, he, although they went to some great effort, uh, you can see here they excavated, you can see the, the, the chalk uh, surface now here exposed. Uh, this large stone is called the heel stone, and it is important in the alignment with the summer solstice, as we'll see. Well, they weren't done. Uh, part of the problem is that um, there were some sarsens that fell in 1900, and, and, and there were more. So another renovation took place in the late 1950s. By now, the archaeological techniques have become a little bit more advanced. They weren't quite as brute force. You can see that they used planking all over the ground to protect the ground. And this was a time when several of the sarsens were, um, were uh, repositioned upright and also embedded in concrete so they wouldn't fall over. And they also reset several of the blue stones. Now, the big ones are called sarsens, and the small ones, like this one here, is a blue stone. It's a much smaller stone. And there are a lot of those blue stones, and they are, they are central to the story of stone. I think this is a place for a video. No. All right. So Stonehenge wasn't built all at once. It was built in several what are, what are recognized as stages over a time period of roughly 800 years. Imagine, as we live from one presidential administration to the next, think how many times our nation's space policy has changed, because it's changed hands since the time of President Kennedy. This, by the way, just for your information, this is the week, 50 years ago, when the last astronauts left the moon from Apollo. So imagine a public works project that took 800 years to complete. You have a Kelly? Yes. That's how long projects take out of highways. And this is about, we get the big thing. Okay, we know what happened. Okay, so so it was built in stage. So let's talk about those stages. Here's the first stage. You can see now you know the terminology, the hinge, which is the circular outline. A hinge consists of a, of a hill, a circular hill, and a circular ditch. Usually the hill is on the outside. At Stonehenge, it's reversed. The hill is on the inside and the ditch is on the outside. Very interesting. And we don't know why. It's just interesting. The other thing is that the this first stage, there were four stones erected. These were blue stones, which are smaller than the big ones. And I'll get to why they're called blue stones in a second. No questions will be left unanswered, I promise. You notice there are four of them. Two of them are actually atop a small hill called the Barrow. Uh, there's an entrance way uh, in the northeast corner, which is typical uh, for these stone monuments. It was always a, a sort of a parade room. Uh, because they were used ceremonially for so many things. So four stones uh, around this barrel. Now you can imagine, this is, a, this is Stone Age time. There are no shovels, all right? There are no horses. They did this all by hand. So they would take uh, uh, picks, like uh, antler picks, uh, antler horns, shaped like a pick to sort of scrape all this stuff into hills. Fortunately, it was pretty soft. The chalk is pretty soft, so, that, so they were able to do that. Uh, and, and it was it was during this first stage. Let me back up a couple of seconds just for just to point out there. You can see the holes indicated in, just inside the, the hinge, right? These are the Aubrey holes. And during the first few modern, uh, this is what they look like today. There's one over there uh, at the lower left of that picture. Um, modern excavations, beginning with with Hawley's time in the early uh, 1900s found a lot of cremated human remains. And so it was thought that this was a series of stones where families buried their cremated dead. Uh, turns out that was probably a human bone, and you'll see why. Because they were all, and this, was, this uh, picture on the, on the left here is from a more recent excavation with really high quality uh, techniques. Uh, I'm covering one of the articles. You see the scale of it. They're about a meter across. They're pretty deep. And, you know, you think about it, if you were going to bury your, your dead, 
that's a bigger hole that you need really for that purpose. And so one of the things that became evident during this last excavation is that there were chips of rock inside these auditory holes that were consistent for having come from Wales. Wales is the province of the British, uh, uh, Great Britain, that's you know the one that sticks out there in the big line for, for Ireland. Okay, stage number two was the introduction of bluestones. Now, these bluestones do not exist anywhere near Stonehenge as it exists today. They had to have come from somewhere. And the nearest place, they're an igneous stone. Uh, and they're called bluestones because when they're when they're freshly broken open or if they're made wet, they sort of have a, a dark bluish cast. The only place these bluestones could have come from was Wales. They're not anywhere near this part of England. That part of Wales is more than a hundred miles away. This is what a bluestone looks like with a human, uh, human for scale. <laughs> uh, this is from our trip this uh, uh, three summers ago, and uh, they're tall and they're heavy. Uh, not nearly as tall as the big sarsens, but they're still plenty heavy. So the question is, why are they there? They had to have come from Wales, and for many years they, they they were known to have come from Wales for a long time, close to a century. Exactly where it was not known until. This paper came out in 2019 by a team led by Mike Parker Pearson, who is the leading Stonehenge um, uh, researcher in terms of, of its history and its geologic, uh, how it came to be. And Pearson and his team went to Wales, and there were many outcrops of this particular kind of igneous stone, but they used uh, sort of CSI, you know, geomorphology, geochemistry techniques. To determine that they had they had to have come from a very specific site. This one right here called Candor. Can Can Gedor, excuse me. Uh, there were other outcrops there, but this one had this this dolerite, which is a geological name for this stone, was spotted in very distinctive ways, and they they pinpointed that. When this paper came out, I've been following Stonehenge for decades, been to it a couple of times. And I contacted Pearson by email. Hello, I'm with Sky Telescope Magazine. <laughs> uh, I really follow this. We'd love to do some uh, write up on your work. And you told me more about it. Got an email back. Hi, this is Professor Pearson. I'm on medical leave. I won't be able to respond to your email for three months. Great. Next day, another email from Professor Pearson. Hi, this is Mrs. Professor Pearson. And how lovely to hear about your interest in Stonehenge. And yes, uh, the, the place that the, uh, that the stones are is, is accessible to the public. It's, uh, there's a, it's a sheep farm. You go to the farmer's house right here. And by the way, at the end of the road, there's a lovely park you should try. Oh, and here's the map that's going to need final piece. Wow, this is great. So I turned the show. This is like March of 2019, the spring pandemic. I said, sweet, do you like to go to Wales? How many of you have ever been to Wales? Any one, a few of you. That's great. Great. Wales is not on anyone's travel list or bucket list. It's a lovely place. It's got a lot. It's, you can travel up the coast. Uh, there are a lot of nifty castles, beautiful scenery, very warm people. And you can learn about a week. It's a great place to come. Of course, to get to Wales, you had to go to London first. And Stonehenge was near London. So we decided to go and visit Stonehenge on our way to Wales. And we did that. So here's Professor Pearson. He's a very jolly guy uh, in front of Stonehenge. And I think this next thing, oh, okay. So, so here is the outcrop that he discovered where the blue stones that are now at Stonehenge, at least most of them, came from. It's a big pile of rocks. The evidence is that this has been quarried for lots of reasons for 5,000 years. And, and so I was able, this is my credit, I was able to find this place by coming through a sheep pasture, avoiding the flaps um, and the gullies and all the other things uh, for about a mile. I finally got there and it was magnificent. It was a beautiful day. And, uh, and I could, you know, I was just thinking 5,000 years ago, there were people here creating these big stone pillars um, with the most crudest of means. Remember, this is, this is stone age stuff. So all they really had were, um, they had no metal tools, right? they had no hammers. They, they would find natural cracks 
in the stone, shove a wooden wedge in it, hammer on it until the, the, the slab opened, and then it would drag it away. There's evidence for all of that here. So I said, wow, this is great. I'm going to take a sample. Now, it wasn't raining stone hinge. All right, this is a public, this is, it's still being used. People still come here to get stones for, for mailbox posts and stuff. And so I thought I should, I should bring a piece home. So you can see that it's kind of overgrown, and that a lot of the stones are really large. <laughs> so I went looking for a small one, no dice. The only ones that were even you know, loose were really way too big for my carrying on the What to do? Well, there's nobody around, so I picked one out. Someone smashing it against the ground into a bunch of pieces until I found one that was small enough to break it. <laughs> I wanted to check this out afterwards. It is spotted. It's a, it's a really nifty little stone, right? Uh, and uh, it's quite the compensation piece in the BD household, let me tell you. So, so having done that, uh, I got re really interested in this whole story. This was new news. That we found a place in Wales where these stones had come from. We still didn't know why they dragged them for 100 miles to Salisbury Plain. But this is one of the routes they took. Either they went by sea, went by land and took by sea, I guess. Uh, but it was still an arduous thing to do. And uh, the key seems to be not Stonehenge, but this place called Wamon, which is not far away from the quarry site. It was known to be a partial stone circle. There's only four stones, and only one of them is still standing. But they're in a kind of arc. And the question is, could they have been the remnants of a much larger stone circle? And so uh, Professor Pearson took a team out there in 2017 and 18. And you can see the, the bits of stone that are still there. And they tried to figure out where the rest of the holes were. Now, the neat thing is, we have techniques now especially ground penetrating radar that can determine changes in the density of the soil uh, uh, underneath the gravel. If many of you have ever dug a hole and then filled it back in, you know that the character of the soil that you put in has a different density than what you started with. And so even if you fill it in so it's flush with the ground, the ground penetrating radar says there's a hole in there. And so they drug this and they discovered that there were a bunch of holes in the shape of the surface. This was once a full stone circle. And if I'm really lucky, we'll get the we'll get the video to work here. As one hole after another was unearthed, the shape of the circle was revealed. And its dimensions got the team excited. Its diameter, 110 meters, was exactly the same as the outer perimeter around Stonehenge. The chances of the two having exactly the same dimensions are really very slim. Wine Man could be the predecessor for Stonehenge. But they needed more proof. Could they find evidence of a direct connection between the two monuments? An odd-shaped stone hole provided an opportunity to once again use photogrammetry. We could see the exact shape of the base of each stone that had stood in them. And one of them was very unusual because it had a slightly kind of pentagonal cross-section. And what was interesting was that there was one at Stonehenge which had a very similar form. Could they match the shape of the wine mound hole to the stone at Stonehenge? It fitted like a key in a lock. But this evidence alone was not conclusive. They still didn't know when the circle was constructed. So the question was, if you missed it on the last camera of, uh, of, of the video, was, okay, the stones were, there were originally blue stones there. Blue stones at Stonehenge that match 
the composition. The question is, were the stones in the high mountain removed at the same time that the stones appeared at Stonehenge? Right? And so they used a, a technique called optically stimulated luminescence. Essentially, it's this the quartz grains in the in the in the holes in the soil in the holes have a memory of exposure to sunlight the, the crystal lattice in the quartz gets disturbed in such a way that it's essentially a, a um a, it sets a chronology a chronometer if you will for when those grains were exposed to sunlight but they did that they found that they were exactly uh three thousand years old this might be See. Right, and so it was dated to sometime between 3600 and 3000 BC. The stones were in those holes and removed, which is consistent with the beginning, the very beginning of the uh, stone, uh, blue stone appearance at Stonehenge. So, not only now do we know uh, that the stones came from Wales and where they came from Wales, we also know that the ones that were in that stone circle in Wales were removed and transported to Stonehenge. So let's see if this it, up. it looked very different. To how it looks now. The monument we see today dates to around 2500 BC. But Mike's team confirmed the existence of numerous empty stone holes, evidence that the stones have been rearranged multiple times. The original configuration, dating from around 3000 BC, was an enormous circle made entirely of blue stones. Okay, I'm sorry for that, but let me recap. Um, so the the evidence showed that the blue stones were actually in the Hills. And that over time they were rearranged multiple times. They started out first was in stage one where they were in the Aubrey Holes. So the Aubrey Holes were never originally intended for pre made. They were the blue stones that were transported from Wales, having been a stone circle there, to um, to the Salisbury Plain to, to create a new stone circle. And so we still don't know why they did it. Why did they take a stone circle, a perfectly functional stone circle in Wales, and drag it to the Salisbury Plain? That's still the missing piece here. Now, there's a there's a, a legendary story from the 1100s that a, a written record, a written story, a narrative, how Merlin, you know, Merlin, King Arthur's sorcerer. <coughs> wanted to build a memorial to the English, uh, to dead English soldiers. And so he dispatched an army to Ireland, but in those days, Ireland and Wales were kind of merged in thinking, dispatched uh, a, a, an army to giant stands in Ireland. Now, I may have been to Belfast, the Belfast area, and there would be an amazing Geologic outcrop on the seashore called uh, uh, the Giants Crosley. Thank you, Giants which is which is made up of stones that are very much like this. They're, they're called columnarly jointed basalt. It's an amazing place. You should go there sometime. And and so there's a maybe a grain of truth of this legend about these stones being brought from Ireland to build Stonehenge and then erected by you know. It's the Giants, well, that's that's a little fanciful, but that's the story anyway. So, so the question still is, why Salford? Why this nondescript plane out in the middle of nowhere? And it was during the excavations uh, about a, a decade ago that they again went down to the chalk level, and they discovered in the chalk scourings from glaciation from the end of the last ice age, where glaciers were moving over this territory. And it created linear gouges in the chalk that aligned with the direction 
of the summer solstice sunrise. Now, if you were a Neolithic uh, wise shaman, whatever you want to be, and you saw this alignment, there was something special about it. And so this is the best reason that we have. Because the summer solstice was an important calendrical turning point, right? It was, it was the beginning of the end for summer. <laughs> Just as the winter solstice that we're about to have, right, is a turning point and is widely celebrated uh, originally in Europe and lots of places, the, 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 the tide was turning and the light was going to start coming back. So this alignment toward the summer solstice, sunrise, and also, by the way, to the winter solstice sunset. If you think about it, they're uh, diametrically opposed. Probably is the reason. Probably is the reason, at least as best we know. So we've had these couple of stages where first there was the hinge and the armory holes, which eventually uh, took the, uh, the blue stones. Subsequently, the, the center circle, what we think of as modern day stone edge, uh, took place. But in the meantime, the blue stones were moved around a lot because we're fairly, fairly portable, different configurations. Remember, this is taking place over centuries of time. So different generations of, of the tribal leaders, wherever they might have been, might have had different ideas of where the, the, the blue stones ought to be. And so it was in this last, uh, one of these last major stages, around roughly around the 2400 BC, that what we know today is the Sargent Circle came to be. And these stones are sandstone, and they are not from Wales. They're from uh, the, the immediate area, as you see. But this is a this is a current map. All every stone, every hole has a number and an identification now. It's been very well uh, characterized. The map, some you can see that some of the, the Sarsons especially are lying on their side. Uh, some of them have, have were clearly must have been broken in falling over and they're gone. Uh, repurposed for something and and so these these sarsens are truly massive stones they're uh they're uh you know they weigh about 25 tons they're 15 feet tall there were 30 of them this is a standing one right the capstones are, are different there but it's a unique construction unique in the sense that all right so first of all they're sandstone so they're 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 well shaped right they are truly pillars they're not just kind of they were actually have been shaped. And the quarry site is not far away, uh, uh, in a place called Longmore Down, not far from the stuff. And in those, by then, this is this is now we're getting into, into the early Neolithic, there were hand tools available. So sandstone is pretty easily worked. And so you could you can imagine people shaping these stones into the nice shapes that they ended up being. Getting them there was a totally different issue. Uh, this is a, a you know, our, you probably heard that this applies to the pyramids in Egypt. Well, they just put logs on the ground and then they rolled them on, on the ground like all well, Doesn't work. My work on asphalt does not work on a church, right? Because the logs, the stones are so heavy, all the pressures on the logs, the logs get pressed into the ground very quite easily. So it couldn't have been that simple. Maybe a sled, the sled would, would suffer from the same sort of entrenchment. And I just came across this the other day. Let's see if this works. This is a little video with no audio. So I'm guaranteed it'll work. That maybe they put rows of, of, of wood uh, pilings on the ground and then roll the sleds over those. That might make sense. Um, so we'll see. Anyway, whatever the reason, remember, no metal tools, no horses, no wheels. And they managed to move all these stones. Not only did they drag them to the site, but they got them erected and they got the big ones put on top. And you say, how could they possibly have gotten those big ones raised up there? It's actually pretty simple. What they would have done, let's take the other three on the far left. They would have built on the outside a huge earthen ramp, right? Gradually increasing in height until it got to the height of the, the, the two stones that they were going to send them. So then all they had to do was drag it up the ramp, put it on top, and then get rid of the ramp. Get rid of the dirt ramp. So that's probably how that happened. But still, it's remarkable. And there are other things about this that are remarkable, too. This is the only known stone, standing stone monument 
that used not only tongue and groove construction, but more mortise and tenon construction, the, the, the bumps and the holes that they fit into. Incredibly sophisticated. Now, this, these techniques were known in, in Stone Age times, but they'd never been used on this scale. And so it's just remarkable. We think of these people as being, you know, they didn't leave any written language, but they were they were obviously very capable builders. And so this is Stonehenge as it looks today. There's the outer circle of 30 stones, and then there, there are these five inner trellipons, they're called, in a horseshoe shape that are on the inside, and then there's there's blue stones all over the place. And so that's that's what we have today. Uh, the largest, the, the trolithons, the ones in that horseshoe are actually much larger. Some of them are, uh, one of them is 30 feet long, uh, and they must uh, they must have, have been, you know, uh, tens of tons, really hard to move around. Okay, so, here we go. Here's another audio that we're not going to hear. So I'm going to narrate. Um, this is a, a continuing problem I have with this, with this particular talk. I don't know what it is. Hmm. Anyway, durings and walls must have been a settlement. This is where the workers live inside this, this sort of protected enclosure. There could have been up to 10,000 people there. And so nearby, they built wood hands. A huge right, circle. and so this would have been their, their. This is why they think this was a monument to the living. Stonehenge might have been a monument to the but you can see here representations of how the different phases uh, happened. And and it's, it's this has to be an internet thing because it's playing great on my on this is a, 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 a bandwidth sort of thing, but in any case. All of this came together by about 2400 BC in the form that we know it today. And so we're starting to answer the question of when it was built and uh, how it was built. The question then was why. And so uh, I've mentioned this summer solstice sunrise. This is for, for those who are uh, need a refresher on this. You know, the Earth's axis, spin axis is tipped with respect to its orbit. And so in, in June, when we're when the northern hemisphere is tipped toward the sun, we have summer. That's why it gets hot in summer. Not because we're closer to the sun. We'll be our closest point to the sun in about two weeks in our orbit. And so also, uh, if, uh, if if it were really about perihelion, then the people in Australia would be having summer at the same time we do, and they don't. So the thing is that that there there's a tipping, and so as the seasons come and go. I'm sure you've noticed that the, the sun's path across the sky changes with the season. During the summer, it sets well north of west, uh, well north of east, sets well north of west, and it arcs high in the sky. That's why summers are hot. Not only is the incidence of the sunlight more direct on the earth, but the sun is in the sky long, right, each day. And winter is just the opposite. Okay, so, so therefore, the point for the sunrise changes with the season. And in June, it's farthest north. On the equinoxes, it's due east. And in the December solstice, it's farthest to the south. A little factoid for you to impress your friends. They all know your geeks anyway, but tell them this. <laughs> on the solstice, on the equinoxes, the sun rises due east and sets due west everywhere. So if you always want to know where due east is from where you live, of the equinox is the time to check that out. Okay, so in some in, in, in Stonehenge's case, there were those grooves that made the line. There's the heel stone that I mentioned earlier. And from the inside of the stone circle in its center, the sun rises right over the heel stone at the summer solstice. Now it's an imperfect alignment, uh, but it's a it's a time for celebration. All manner of crazy people show up. Um, we've seen some of them. Uh, it's a, it, there was a time when they were not allowed inside the stones, but in more recent times they have. And this is actually from the 1980s. Um, and um, and there are all kinds of you know neo pagan priests and and high mucky mucks and so forth. Uh, this guy is named Pendragon, I believe, and he is the grand poobah of the druids. Um, 
And so it turned out that in, in 1981, so this is this here, this is from Stellari. Look at the uh, look at the uh, uh, game counter down there, clicking through the solstice. The sun moves only a very little bit around the time of the solstice. So to actually pick one day and say, ah, that must be the solstice, was imprecise at best. So they probably had a party for a whole week, I guess, <laughs> right? But in any case, in oh, I need to go back to this. I need to go back to this, yes. So in 1981, I had been dating show for a few years, and I had a chance to go to England with for us, we did a road trip. And I had arranged it so that we would be in Stonehenge on the solstice. I played the sky telescope card, I got a pass to get us inside, we got in there, and uh, it was really, it was fun, unfortunately, we didn't see the sunrise. But we had a lot of interesting experiences. I made beer and I'll tell you all. <laughs> Cheryl, who is part, claims to be part druid anyway, um, <laughs> thought this was a really momentous occasion. And in fact, in her mind, I had gone to all this trouble to propose. <laughs> Kelly was clueless. He did not propose. <laughs> Cheryl went away this and appointed, and Kelly was a because he'd seen, you know, that was so much more. Okay. But there's a, there's a happy ending, I guarantee it. All right, so remember this. This is the first page of Stonehenge. And remember those four stones? Why only four stones? Why in that location? The stone circle was centuries in the future. Well, it turns out that those four stones also align with the summer sun and the sunrise. And so maybe this was known even from that rather. They did discover the grooves of the chalk, right? So they used the four stones because it only took two points to figure out where the sunrise was going to be. They didn't have to have a whole stone circle. And so it's, it's probably been in the DNA of, of Stonehenge for a very long time. Now, is that all there is? Was it just they put in all that trouble just for the summer solstice sunrise? Lots of people have tried to tackle this question. And one of them was a guy named Gerald Hawkins. In the 1960s, he said, well, maybe it has to do with lunar alignments too. Now, it turns out that the moon's orbit is tipped five degrees with respect to the plane of the Earth's orbit. And that's important because if they were if they were the same, we have winter and solar eclipses every month, but we don't. So it's tipped a little bit. And not only is it tipped, but the moon's the, that plane of, of the moon's orbit, because of perturbations by the sun and earth, actually precesses around. And this little video will show that. It's called precession of the nodes. The node being the intersection line between the Earth's orbit and the moon's orbit. You see it moving here. It's this five, five degrees. And so over a period of 18.6 years, the plane of the moon's orbit actually cycles around, right? And so its position in the sky can be, depending on where you are in the cycle, plus or minus five degrees for a total range of, of 10 degrees. So like in one, at one point, uh, there's the sun over there, there's the moon here. So at one point, at full moon, right, the moon might be five degrees above the, the ecliptic, and then half a cycle later could be five degrees below. And so consequently, from the standpoint of stony, Yes, every year there's a point where the moon is farthest north when it rises, and a point where it's farthest south, just like the sun. But because of this plus or minus five degrees, there's some slot there. And it turns out that this guy, Gerald Hawkins, concluded, he said, these Stonehenge builders, they had figured this out because they had been watching the sky for hundreds of years. They knew about this precession of the nodes, actually it's called regression of the nodes. Um, and so they built a lunar calendar into Stonehenge too to measure these things. And so Hawkins looked at all these holes, the Aubrey holes, and he, he worked the procession back so he knew which way the when when the, the solstices and equinoxes, and he came with all kinds of alignments, and you see them here. They've never been proven. It's an interesting speculation, but there's no there were so there are so many holes around you could draw two lines, you know, anything. <laughs> So Hawkins has, has never really caught on. Just recently, a whole new concept came out by a, a, a Stonehenge researcher named Timothy Darbel, also in England. He said, you know, there's some interesting things about the, the Sarsons coming. They're not all the same size. Look at the one on the left, it's, it's skinny, 
and the one on the right is pretty thick. Why is that? It turns out that there are 30 stars and stars, and every 10th one is skinny. Here's a, here's a little chart showing that. Okay? The height is, is, is not the height of the stone. It's the width of the, of the stars and stars. And you notice 21, which is here, right? And 11, which is there. They're short. They're substantially, I'm, not, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're substantially skinnier. And if you look at the spacing between the stars, it's very even. The blue lines show the spacing between the stones. So you have, they, they weren't sloppy about this. They spaced the stones evenly, but every tenth one of them is a good stone. Why is that? There are 30 stones. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Mm -hmm. 30 days basically in illumination, 29 and a half days from new moon to new moon. Right? So 30 times 12 is 360. I can hear you saying, Kelly, it's five days short of a year. Well, we've got these trilithons on the inside. Five of them. That's 365. And I can hear you thinking, Kelly, what about leap years? Yeah, a sequence of four years account account for the leap years. One, two, three, four. It fits pretty nicely. I don't know if it's true. It's just one of the many speculations. But I got to say, I really like that wonderful thing, right? Okay, so that's the news from Sonia. How about the real life boots on the ground stone? You can visit Stonehenge. This is me driving, and Cheryl trying to figure out how to take a picture. <laughs> Cheryl, it's the button on top, the silver button. Press it now. This is Stonehenge. It's very close to a major highway that runs through this part of the countryside. And in fact, there's a there's a plan. It is so disruptive. This highway is totally choked with all kinds of cars. So the British government wants to build a wider highway, and since it's on some of this archaeologically interesting territory, they actually want to bury it completely under stone edge in a tunnel and have it come out the other side. It's very controversial. So this is A303 is the road if you want to check this out. Look it up. There's a whole, uh, there have been studies and designs and everything. It hasn't started yet, but, but they got a problem. You can see stone edge in the distance and you can see all the people there. It is a very popular place. In fact, oops, I'm sorry, I see. Okay, so if you were to go visit Stonehenge, the parking lot is wherever it's going. They bus you into this location, and then you can walk around. Uh, you can see the you can see the pathway. You cannot get inside the stone circle itself. Eight hundred thousand people a year visit this mine. Busload after busload after busload of tourists. Don't do that to yourselves if you want to go. What you should do, it costs about twenty bucks to get in. What you should do is pay extra sixty bucks to go at dawn or dusk when you and 30 of your closest new friends hop on the bus and they let you inside for 45 minutes nobody else around and so that's what we did Cheryl and I three years ago we paid our, our 60 bucks we got inside we got to get you can't touch the stone but you can you can definitely see them. I'm running around taking pictures. The, the rangers are saying, "Hey, come back here!" You know. And this time, I wasn't going to screw up, ladies and gentlemen. In the middle of our visit, our 45 minutes with Stonehenge, I turned around to Cheryl and I presented her with a lovely <laughs> Celtic theme amethyst stone, a turquoise stone, and I maybe not completely made up for failing to prove us. But I went a long way toward it. Thank you very much. <laughs>